Live from ABC7, this is Eyewitness News at 7 p.m. on LA56. A former Power Ranger arrested, accused of murdering his roommate. A historic church goes up in flames, what we're learning about the early morning fire. A family of three found dead in Koreatown, what we're learning about the gruesome discovery. Good evening, I'm Giovanna Lotta. I'm Jory Rand. Welcome to Eyewitness News at 7 on LA 56, LA's only live local newscast at 7 p.m. We begin the hour with breaking news. We've just learned there's been an arrest in the murder of a transgender woman in Van Nuys. Police have identified the victim as Michelle Vash Payne. Her boyfriend, 25-year-old Ezekiel Deer, walked into the police station this afternoon and turned himself in. Van Nuys detectives are currently interviewing him. Firefighters found the 33-year-old's body yesterday as they put out a fire. Detectives say she had several stab wounds and that they did recover a weapon at the scene. Meantime, a former actor on the Power Rangers television series has been arrested in the fatal stabbing of his roommate. It happened last night on the 38,000 block of San Francisco Canyon Road in Green Valley. Eyewitness News reporter Leanne Suter has the latest on the investigation. We're both tormented by fate we didn't choose. Ricardo Medina battled the bad guys as a red Power Ranger on the popular kids TV show. The 36-year-old actor seen here on his Facebook page is now behind bars, accused of killing his roommate with a sword. We didn't know what was going on, so we thought we were getting out of the city to get away from that. Neighbors in rural Green Valley in the Angeles National Forest stunned by the violence. Authorities were called to the home on San Francisco Canyon Road around 4 p.m. yesterday. According to investigators, Medina called 911 saying he'd gotten into a fight with his roommate, 36-year-old Joshua Sutter, and stabbed him. Detectives say the pair got into an argument which turned physical. Medina retreated to his bedroom with his girlfriend, but Sutter followed them, forcing the door open. That's when the actor stabbed Sutter once in the abdomen with a sword he kept next to his bedroom door. Sutter was rushed to the hospital where he later died. Neighbors say Medina had only lived in the home about two months and say he usually kept to himself. So, um, like I said, we brought him some bread and, and just tried to interact a little bit with him, but he was more of the, you know, the type, that guy that didn't really want to communicate. So, Medina's agent, Gar Lester, says the actor is a great friend and is stunned by what has happened and says he believes there has to be more to the story. For now, the actor remains behind bars, accused of a deadly crime. Medina is being held on a million dollars bail. He is set to make his first appearance in court Tuesday morning. Near Green Valley, Leon Suter, ABC7 Eyewitness News. A devastating fire in Riverside causes more than $2 million in damage to an historic church. Eyewitness News reporter Darsha Phillips explains despite the heavy damage, parishioners say they plan to rebuild. Members of the Living Word Church of Riverside gather and pray outside after a massive fire destroyed their place of worship. It's very heartbreaking. Uh, this is like um, feeling like it's very personal. It's like a, my own home burnt. So we're just trying to keep our spirits up because we know it's easy, it's easy to get depressed. It's easy to, to just get stuck. It takes work to stay joyful. The fire started about 1 a.m. and spread quickly. The majority of the fire was up in the attic and it actually self-ended through the roof um, and that really compromised the structural integrity of the building. The roof collapsed. Luckily, no one was injured. Investigators believe an electrical failure sparked this fire in the attic of the building, spreading rapidly, causing $2.5 million in damages. The church is a total loss. Parishioners are leaning on their faith in this difficult time. The church, they say, that also serves as a recovery center for men and women, is just a building. Sometimes when we, something new is going to come, we got to let go of the old. Service was still held Sunday morning at Fox Theater. <laughs> A temporary location until the congregation can rebuild. We're not going to let this stop us. Yeah, God is good. We're not going to let this stop us. In Riverside, I'm Darsha Phillips, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Darsha. Now to Koreatown, where police are investigating a possible murder-suicide. The three bodies found were discovered at an apartment on the 1100 block of Crenshaw Boulevard. Police believe a man killed his elderly parents and then took his own life. The apartment manager checked on the unit after smelling a foul odor. 
and found the bodies there. Residents can't believe this would happen in their neighborhood. That's sad. That's, that's really sad. I would have never expected any of that around here. I mean, not at all. Um, very quiet people. They would come out every now and then. Um, not too much, but something I wouldn't expect. If you have any information about the case, you are asked to call police. A teenager is being charged with a hate crime after allegedly stabbing two black men in a Covina shopping center parking lot. 19-year-old Luis Vasquez of La Puente was arrested on charges of suspicion of attempted murder, use of a deadly weapon, and a hate crime for the unprovoked attack on the two men Saturday evening. One of the victims was stabbed on his right shoulder and left knee. The other was stabbed in the back. Both are expected to survive. Both victims don't know each other. Uh, both victims were African American, uh, and it just seems that it was a uh, unprovoked attack on both people. Vasquez, a self-described gang member, is being held on five hundred thousand dollars bail. And with all the Super Bowl parties, authorities are in position to catch those who choose to drink and drive. The Glendale Police Department is one of the many agencies conducting DUI saturation patrols. During Super Bowl Sunday, there's a spike in the number of drivers who become involved in a DUI-related crash, resulting in injury or death. Last year, the uh, city of Glendale made six DUI arrests on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, this year, uh, we'll be out in full force. Uh, hopefully we don't have to make that many arrests because people ultimately will make the right decision and get a, a designated driver. The Auto Club is offering its free tipsy tow service from 6 p.m. today through 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Police advise anyone drinking to leave their keys at home, designate a sober driver, or use a taxi or public transportation. Time now to get a first check of our forecast, and there's a lot of sunshine in it. Danny Romero has all the details. Danny. All right, thanks very much, Jory and Giovanna. Yeah, a lot of sunshine in our afternoons and mostly clear nights here in the evening hours. Our Laguna Beach camera and HD, I'll give you an idea of this part of the coast right now. Just a few clouds moving in. We'll see a few more later on in some beach areas, even some fog before the week is done. We look outside the downtown LA and the skies there are mostly clear as well. And today, well above normal once again as far as the temps are concerned. 76 with our afternoon high today downtown, 68 is the average temp for this date. Gorgeous sunset at 524, sun rising up tomorrow at 650. The numbers right now heading towards a very mild night. 42 in Wrightwood right now. We're showing 52 for Victorville and 43 for Big Bear. Some temps still fairly warm. Look at Santa Clarita. Still 75 degrees here in the 7 o'clock hour with Santa Monica checking in at 60 degrees. Now, as far as the sunshine ahead, as Joey mentioned, I'll show you all of that when I come back with a live Mega Doppler 7000 HD seven day forecast in just a little bit. Giovanna, Jory, go ahead. Thank you, Danny. Gas prices are on the rise again across Southern California. The average price for a gallon of regular gas in LA County is up for the third time in four days to two dollars and forty eight cents. Until last week, the price had dropped for 23 days straight. The uh, rising prices at the pump follow a sharp increase in wholesale prices after they dropped to a six-year low. Investors also anticipate a tightening of supply from local refineries as they get ready to switch to the summer fuel blends. Workers went on strike today at nine U.S. oil refineries in Texas and California, including one in Carson. Some of them began picketing outside the Tesoro plant today. The United Steelworkers Union says negotiations with the Shell Oil Company broke down less than two weeks after they began. Their contract expired at midnight last night. The union asked about 3,800 workers to go on strike, about 800 of them at the Tesoro refinery in Carson. Many of our workers are working six days a week, 12 hours a day, and we've been doing that for a long time. The industry refuses to hire people. We want them to hire more people. In addition to fatigue, the union says it's also focused on health care costs and wages. DeSoro says the strike notification is disappointing, but that contingency plans are in place to operate safely. In a statement, the company says... We have successfully made the transition and are operating our Carson refinery despite the USW violating the long-standing practice of providing a minimum of 24 hours strike notice. Police have arrested a man and a woman suspected in a carjacking in Arupa Valley. Police say Cassandra Sari of Palm Springs and Ayemga Magallanes of Arupa Valley were passengers in the car. They forced the victim out of the vehicle and got on the 60 freeway. The suspects were arrested a short time later. 
later. Police recovered a loaded gun used during the carjacking. And a woman is rescued after her car lands on the top of a fence in South L.A. Look at that picture. This was the scene about 2.30 this morning at Century between Figueroa and Vermont. Police have not released many details on the crash, but it appears to have involved three small cars. The woman in the car on top of the fence was rescued by fire crews and taken to a hospital. Officials treated another woman at the scene. An investigation is underway following an officer involved shooting at a 7-Eleven in Garden Grove. Officers were called to a robbery in progress at a 7-Eleven on Brookhurst around 1.30 this morning. Authorities say the suspect, 23-year-old Stephen Loya, was armed and shots were fired. Loya ran away, but authorities arrested him a short time later. No one was injured. Still ahead, a major winter storm hits the Midwest and is now heading toward the northeast. Plus, a mystery in the skies over Boston as a passenger jet gets ready for a landing. And a remarkable rescue after three climbers fall from 10,000 feet up on Oregon's Mount Hood. A massive blast of winter weather is making its way across the country right now. About 100 million Americans impacted by snow, sleet, and rain. And it's setting the stage for potentially dangerous driving conditions. ABC's Alex Perez has the latest. Sunday started early for the Midwest, from the snowplow drivers to the shovelers to the snow blowers. A massive winter storm is moving across the region, dumping inches of snow and promising blizzard-like conditions for Chicago. Everyone here is on the job today so people can get to their job tomorrow. While a brave few headed out for their Sunday morning coffee in the Windy City, they stuck to the sidewalks, not the streets. On foot, yes. I'm not going to move my car probably today. In Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Ohio, snow already covers roads, sending cars as skidding off highways and truck drivers turning into rest stops. In the Northeast, anticipation and preparation, even as the region recovers from last week's blizzard. From New York City to Boston, serious concerns for commuters. If you have the option to stay home or avoid travel, uh, we ask you, you do it. In the Big Apple, the city preparing for snow, ice, and rain. The biggest threat in this case would be ice. We would expect a lot of icing on our roads and sidewalks. 
Travel is already an issue at airports. More than 2,000 flights canceled nationwide. Crews at Chicago's O'Hare International working overtime to stay ahead of the snow. And even down in Phoenix, big delays thanks to fog as those last-minute Super Bowl fans arrive before the big game. And one of the big concerns here in Chicago, that blowing snow, wind gusts 40 miles per hour. There's a blizzard warning in the Chicago area until midnight. Alex Perez, ABC News, Chicago. So the northeast is going to get hit again, but something tells me the folks up there maybe might not mind. <laughs> I take it one step further. Some of them might not be feeling that snow. Yes, that's they right. won't be feeling it's a day other than again. euphoria. Yeah, exactly. That's for the Patriots. Be a numb. little bit numb. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, things on ice up there not necessarily going to be here, outside. They don't have to worry about. I'm snow. telling you, for us, you, you, we put ice in our drinks. That's all yeah. we're worried about, really. We go outside now, look at for a Sunday night. Not a bad one. It's been the end to a pretty good weekend. We're looking outside our live shot, uh, checking out how it's looking out. It's our Irvine Spectrum camera, and their OC is looking pretty good tonight on a Sunday night. Mostly clear skies in this look outside to the OC. Downtown LA we go to, and there we're seeing mostly clear skies as well. Temps are very nice, 63 degrees our temp. Calm winds and fairly dry, 56% relative humidity. And look at this. Sunsets have been just gorgeous this weekend. We have another one for you here. Our Angeles National Forest camera showing you as the sun sets in the west, the, sky, the clouds up above. That's just a gorgeous, gorgeous picture and the last flash of light. Now, here's what's coming in during the night and tomorrow morning. We're going to see some of that marine layer coming mainly to the coastal areas, not pushing much inland at all for Monday morning. Looking ahead now to Monday afternoon, Monday night into Tuesday morning, marine layer returns, but again, only on the coast and coastal valleys. So we'll see the inland spots warm up a lot quicker during the day and the coast stay a little bit on the cooler side. Reason being, we've got some high clouds coming from the north. A ridge of high pressure is in place. Not a real strong one, but enough offshore flow to keep that cooler air just to the coastal spots. Warm things up inland, not real hot, not real windy, but boy, so, so nice. We look at 48 overnight in Riverside, 51 for Ontario tonight, down to 52 in Pasadena. We'll get down to the 30s in Fraser Park in Lancaster, and then the highs tomorrow, I'm showing what I'm talking about here. 73 in Santa Clarita, warm inland. Cooler on the coast, 68 for Malibu, 66 for Redondo Beach, but 77 for Ontario, Riverside in San Bernardino, now the seven-day. Power back, the weather, watch the numbers go. 72s up to 74 and 75 by middle of the week for LA Metro and Orange County, and then into a warm weekend to the mid-70s there for the valleys and the Inland Empire. Mostly sunny skies to start the week, and then the warming begins. Less cloud cover by midweek, and then into the weekend. Numbers bump up to 77s, taking that into 76s on Saturday, and then 75 on Sunday. The beach areas, well, there's the clouds lingering most of the days uh, for the first part of the week. 68, 69 for the highs. A little foggy condition Thursday morning, but Friday in the weekend, a little bump up in the temps, a little less and a thinner marine layer. For the mountains, cool, breezy conditions starting out the week, mostly sunny skies. And temps staying about the same through the week, upper 50s, pushing 60 degrees. We go towards the weekend, which should be a nice, sunny, clear one with overnight lows, though, down in the 20s. The mountains, after all. High desert, sunny, breezy start to the week. Low 70s for the highs and kind of staying there most of the week and into the weekend with just a little warmer on Saturday. Otherwise, we're talking about sunshine all the way through for just about everybody. Maybe the beach is a little bit foggier to the morning hours, otherwise can't complain. A lot of sunshine, no rain, and no snow. Yeah. All right? Thank you, Danny. There you go, Danny. Thanks, Danny. Okay. Two pilots survived a terrifying crash after their planes collided in midair in Alaska. It happened yesterday afternoon north of Anchorage. In the Matsu Valley, one pilot suffered serious injuries. The other had moderate injuries. Both of the planes were fixed-winged aircraft. Neither plane was carrying passengers at the time. An Alaska state trooper says one of the planes was an Alaska wildlife trooper plane. The cause of the crash is under investigation. And another pilot getting ready to land a passenger jet at Boston's Logan Airport spotted something flying above it. Was it a drone or is there another explanation? ABC's Kendis Gibson with the investigation. Something just flew by us about uh, 100 feet above us. A United Airlines jet flying at 7,000 feet when the pilot spots a mysterious object. I don't know if it was a balloon or a drone. The object with an unusual shape and color coming very close to that 737 commercial jet. We just went by it very fast. That object was slightly painted. It was uh, red and blue. Do you know roughly what size? You know, we were kind of laughing about it up here. We may have football favor, but it was it was 
football shape. No laughing matter to the FAA, which claims the object was in fact a drone. But at 7,000 feet, many wondering, just what did they see in the sky? The probability is that it was not a drone, but the possibility does exist. The main thing is that drones that can get that high are not very commonly found today because they're very expensive. The object very different from other drones buzzing around the country every day. Those tiny personal use copters, a big problem for pilots. We just saw a little drone below us. In the last two weeks, one crash landing on the White House lawn, another one used to transport drugs, goes down near the U.S.-Mexican border. Going to the big game. And the unusual message at today's Super Bowl. And keep it a no drum zone. Don't spoil the game. Leave your drone at home. The FAA releasing an ad warning spectators to keep their drones at home. But the rules for the devices remain cloudy. No flying within 400 feet of air traffic, with more government guidelines expected this year. Tendis Gibson, ABC News, New York. It is a different world we're living in when you Indeed. have to be told to leave your drone at home. I don't have one, do you? No, nor do I. Wouldn't want to take it to a football game, though. Still ahead, a shooting at a Chuck E. Cheese, the frightening scene caught on camera. And an amazing rescue on Oregon's Mount Hood. Now three hikers are recovering from their near-death experience. Plus, Whitney Houston's daughter, Bobby Christina, remains in the hospital tonight after being found unresponsive in a bathtub. What her father, Bobby Brown, is now saying. Surveillance video has been released of a shooting inside of a Chuck E. Cheese in Missouri Monday night. The video shows a man jumping from a dining booth, pointing a gun and opening fire. Some staff and patrons hid in a locked storage room while police arrived. The victim was shot multiple times and hospitalized in serious condition. Police are now looking for two people of interest, while one 20-year-old woman is under arrest on felony assault charges. Witnesses say the shooting began after an argument during a child's birthday party. In Oregon, three hikers are recovering from serious injuries after a perilous fall from Mount Hood. A National Guard helicopter with a medical team on board lifted them to safety. ABC's Clayton Sandell has the story. 
10,000 feet up Oregon's Mount Hood Saturday, husband and wife climbers Michelle and Brian Carlson suddenly begin tumbling down. They fell probably about 500 feet and landed in the bottom of the crater. Sliding down a 50 degree slope, the Carlson speed right past members of the all volunteer Portland Mountain Rescue Team. They finally stopped but are now facing a new threat. Ice chunks the size of bowling balls careening downhill. To protect the injured couple, rescuers form a human shield for six straight hours. Shoulder to shoulder and stop the ice that was, that was coming down the mountain. What does that say to you? They're the heroes today. The Oregon National Guard airlifted the couple to a hospital. Michelle Carlson has two broken ankles, her husband a broken leg. But they weren't the only ones needing rescue Saturday. About the same time, a third climber fell, sliding right into one of the mountain's steaming volcanic vents, spewing toxic fumes. This climber, however, was uh, just amazingly fortunate. He was very bruised up, very beat up, uh, cut up but he did not appear to have uh, any broken bones. The rescue team says over 8,000 people climb Mount Hood every year, and tonight three of them are lucky to be alive. Clayton Sandell, ABC News, Denver. Very, we sure very are. lucky, yeah. Mm -hmm. We are updating our top stories at 7.30. Plus, fighting terrorists, the debate on how to respond to ISIS following the second beheading of a Japanese journalist. And Bobby Brown asks for privacy as his daughter fights for her life in the hospital. Live from ABC7, 
This is Eyewitness News at 7.30 p.m. on LA 56. Our top story at 7.30, a former Power Ranger from the popular kids TV show accused of killing his roommate with a sword. I'm Jory Rand. I'm Giovanna Lotta. This is Eyewitness News on LA 56, LA's only live local newscast at 7.30 p.m. 36-year-old actor Ricardo Medina, seen here on his Facebook page, was arrested last night after the fatal stabbing of his roommate at their home in Green Valley in the Angeles National Forest. According to investigators, Medina called 911 saying he had gotten into a fight with his roommate, 36-year-old Joshua Sutter, and stabbed him. Medina is being held on $1 million bail. Our other top story, in Riverside, a historic church is completely destroyed after a fire breaks out early this morning. The roof collapsed as firefighters spent more than two hours battling the flames. Investigators say it appears to have been sparked by electrical failure in the attic. Damage is estimated at two and a half million dollars. Whitney Houston's daughter, Bobby Christina Brown, remains hospitalized in a medically induced coma. As ABC's Steve Osinsami reports, her father, Bobby Brown, is now speaking out. There's CPR in progress. We're getting a third party that's not on scene. But she is gurgling at this time. Tonight, Bobby Christina Brown is still hospitalized after she was found unresponsive in a bathtub. And her father, singer Bobby Brown, is speaking out. Privacy is requested in this matter. Please allow for my family to deal with the matter and give my daughter the love and support she needs at this time. The only child of the late Whitney Houston and singer Bobby Brown is reportedly now needing a ventilator to help her breathe. E! Entertainment News is citing sources close to the family. There are conflicting reports, but none of them good. TMZ is reporting that doctors are keeping her in a medically induced coma to reduce swelling on her brain. Multiple reports say her father is by her side, and there are pictures of family outside the hospital. The incident with Bobby Christina happened eerily close to the three-year anniversary of Whitney Houston's death. She, of course, died in a bathtub at the Beverly Hilton Hotel just a day before the Grammy Awards. Whitney Houston was found dead February 11, 2012 with a dozen bottles of pills in her hotel suite. I need a paramedic apparently. I got a 46-year-old female uh -huh. found in the bathroom. Just one year ago, Brown and her husband married and sat down for this interview. The two were both raised like a brother and sister by the late Whitney Houston. Just like her death took us by surprise, our love for each other took us by surprise. The hospital isn't sharing any official word on her condition, but we expect to hear more from police tomorrow. Steve Osinsami, ABC News, Roswell, Georgia. The country of Jordan's foreign minister says their country is as committed as ever to a U.S.-led military coalition against ISIS. This one day after the beheading of Japanese journalist Kenji Goto. Goto had been the subject of negotiations in a trade for a female al-Qaeda prisoner being held in a Jordanian prison. But Jordan wanted proof a second hostage in the deal, one of their pilots, was still alive. Some critics argue that negotiating with ISIS has given the terror group a propaganda victory. Meantime, intelligence officials say they've now identified the man in the beheading videos, currently known as Jihadi John, and are on his trail. Al Jazeera's Australian reporter Peter Greste, seen on the right here, is now free after more than a year behind bars in Egypt. He was released today and whisked away on a flight to Cyprus, but two of his Egyptian colleagues remain jailed in a case condemned by human rights groups as a sham. The three men were arrested back in December of 2013 over their coverage of the crackdown on Islamist, uh, Islamist protests following the military overthrow of President Mohamed Morsi. It's a big party weekend at the University of Virginia, marking the end of the fraternity recruitment period. But the national leaders of 16 sororities are demanding their members stay home. ABC's Gloria Riviera reports from Charlottesville. At the University of Virginia, young men celebrating joining fraternities. A brief return to normal in the wake of now largely discredited allegations of a fraternity gang rape reported in Rolling Stone. UVA is just one of 86 schools nationwide currently under federal investigation for their handling of sexual assault. Just this week, former Vanderbilt football players Brandon Vandenberg and Corey Beatty found guilty on four counts of the rape and sexual battery of a female classmate. But now at UVA, there is growing outrage because in place of raucous midnight parties, it is quiet here after all sorority women ordered to stay home for their own safety by their governing organization. This national organization 
thinks that the solution to rape and sexual assault is to let boys be boys and simply lock up all the women in their sorority houses for this one night out of the year. Fraternities received no such restriction. This is Fraternity Row, and there are new security measures already in place to protect young women at fraternity parties. But the sorority sisters I spoke to say it's not about any one party. It's that separating the sexes, and they say punishing women by making them stay home, is no kind of solution. It's a frustration that has become a rallying cry for many, including senior Story Hinckley, starting an online petition against the mandate, gathering over 2,000 signatures in just a few hours. This controversy leading up to the first police report into those recent Rolling Stone allegations expected to be released in the coming weeks. Gloria Riviera, ABC News, Charlottesville, Virginia. UC Davis police are investigating a hate crime. Students awoke yesterday to find someone had painted swastikas on their Jewish fraternity house, which is located off campus. The frat brothers believe the vandalism may have been done in retaliation to their support for Israel. Um, not something you want to wake up on a Saturday to see, but it, I think hopefully like a positive will come from it and that people will see that anti-Semitism on campus, is, especially here at Davis, is very real. It's not some abstract idea that people are making up. The student body recently voted to pass an act that will urge the UC Regents to divest from companies that provide resources to Israel. UC Davis police say they have very little to go on. All right, turning to your weather, it was a true super Sunday in the weather department. Just gorgeous. Danny Romero has a look at the forecast. Touchdown. Yeah, actually, boy, weather was so nice all over the area. We got ourselves... A uh, good-looking day, and the week ahead, not so bad either. Right now, we look at the Long Beach. Our HD camera shows a pretty clear spot here on this part of the coast, and the temps are very nice right now. 52 in Palmdale, same for Victorville. A little bit cooler in the head of the mountain areas, 41 for Wrightwood, 38 at Big Bear, but we're seeing some pretty nice numbers. Still warm in Santa Clarita at 71 degrees, 66 for Van Nuys. Burbank checked in at 64 degrees. Right now, Santa Monica, one of the cooler spots on the coast. A little more cloud cover there. 60 degrees to temp at the moment, and cooler still in Oxnard at 59 degrees. We head towards the week ahead. Things change a bit. I'll tell you about that when I come back to live. Make it up for 7,000 HD seven-day forecast in just a little bit. Right now, Jory and Giovanna, go ahead. Okay, Danny, we'll see you then. A protest in Los Angeles against the canonization of Father Junipero Serra, a Native American group gathered outside the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels. They do not believe that the founder of nine California missions should achieve sainthood because of what they call the brutal enslavement of natives on church-operated farms. Making Junipero Serra a saint is an immoral, it's a criminal act, it's a genocidal act, it's part of white supremacy. Pope Francis is planning to make Father Junipero Serra a saint during his visit to the U.S. East Coast in September. Firefighters come to the rescue of a dog who became trapped inside of a jetty in Ventura Harbor. The dog and its owner were taking a walk on the beach when the pup suddenly disappeared into the North Jetty. After an hour of searching, the owner then called the fire department. Firefighters could hear the dog whimpering but couldn't see him. It was about 15 to 20 feet deep inside the jetty. Firefighters made their way down, figured out the precise location of the dog, and removed sand to get to it. They were then able to lift the animal out safely. Dog and owner were happily reunited. A nice ending. Call it a cute version of the Super Bowl. Today, the second annual Rosie Bowl got underway. Take a look. This is the Pasadena Humane Society's effort to get shelter dogs adopted. This year's teams were the Sea Dogs versus the Patriots. Get it? Here's how the event got its name. Rosie is a little puppy that we took to the Puppy Bowl last year. And since she was from Pasadena, she was three months old, we named her Rosie. And so, the Ro and so it's become the Rosie Bowl because of her and because of Pasadena. All the dogs in the event are available for adoption. How cute is that? Good stuff. Much more news still to come here on Eyewitness News on LA 56. Including the latest on the measles outbreak, the big question tonight, are you updated on your vaccine? And it was a great day for a run. We'll check out this year's annual Surf City Marathon in Huntington Beach, and you may notice a familiar face in the crowd. She's sitting right next to me. <laughs>
covering Costa Mesa, Pasadena, Camarillo, and all of Southern California. This is Eyewitness News. Welcome back. The measles outbreak continues to grow. At least 84 cases have now been confirmed in 14 states. And there are new concerns about a college student who may have been exposed, or rather exposed, tens of thousands of commuters to this highly contagious disease. As ABC's Mara Skiavacampo reports, some doctors are even making house calls. Measles is very dangerous. Measles sparking unease coast to coast. I think there's a heightened concern right now out in our community. The CDC examining 84 cases so far this year, a 30% increase from the first quarter of 2014, which went on to see the most cases since the virus was declared eradicated in 2000. The latest case in New York, where tens of thousands of people may have been exposed at bustling Penn Station after a barred college student took an Amtrak train from New York City to Niagara Falls. Hey, what are you doing? In hard-hit California, doctors now making house calls to check for measles. It's so easy to be transmitted. Okay. Parents concerned. It just makes me cough. Taking every precaution to ensure their children are healthy. I'm not going to subject my child to going to the doctor's office, you know, where there could be a possible case of the measles and us being unvaccinated. Experts stressing how effective the vaccine, known as MMR, is, despite extremely rare cases, like Kelly Kruger's three-year-old son, who was infected even after being inoculated. And they told us it was measles. It was such a weird kind of old-fashioned thing, like who gets measles? In Phoenix, officials now monitoring 200 people patients of this pediatric clinic for possible exposure. And with an estimated one million visitors pouring in for tonight's Super Bowl, the threat of the virus reaching more people is putting the city on alert. Now, health officials say if you do think you've been exposed, it's important to try and avoid public places and reach out to your doctor because it may not be too late to get vaccinated. Mara Schiavocampo, ABC News, New York. Thousands hit the pavement in Huntington Beach for the annual Surf City Marathon and Half Marathon, including Giovanna. <laughs> and coming up in sports, the final two minutes of tonight's Super Bowl will be talked about for years to come. Kurt has the stunning conclusion next.
And they were off in Huntington Beach bright and early this morning for the 19th annual Surf City USA Marathon. 3,000 runners signed up for the full 26.2 miles. Another 16,000 <laughs> registered for the half marathon. It's, <laughs> it's billed as California's largest on. combined oceanfront marathon and half marathon, drawing runners from all 50 states and 24 nations. So what's so appealing about it? Well, yeah. just ask this year's marathon champ, Shane Inman, who also won last year's half marathon. It was awesome. I loved it out there. It was a real great day. Great, nice course, nice flat, relaxing day. Yeah. Um, running the LA Marathon in March, so I wanted to do on, kind of no, look out for that. It's a great place to do it. JP Slater won the half marathon, and I was among the runners participating yeah. in the half marathon. He said flat there, is a nice flat are. run. Oh, yeah. There I am, oh, there I am. See? It didn't feel flat to me. It no. felt like it was all uphill. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard, yeah. I, no. but fun. Yeah. And I didn't train for it. Let me just say, I did not train for this. Okay, you didn't train for it, but you I did, did 13.1 miles in how, how quickly? I, do I have to say two hours and 25 minutes? Without I training. Be proud. Holy yeah. moly. So that no, that is a bad. fantastic yeah. time. Yeah, not too bad. But she didn't wear heels, just so you know. No, not this race. Not yeah. after mile six. The yeah. next one. Yeah, then, <laughs> then, Superwoman coming through. Look at you. Yeah, no offense to the winner. I'm going to ask you how the race was. It, it was great. The yeah. weather was great, Danny. Wasn't it? Thank it was you. so nice. And the beaches were really, I mean, down Huntington Beach especially, started out kind of the cool side during the morning. I was a little overcast, a little marine layer. But then by the afternoon, Sunshine aplenty. More of that on the way. Let's go outside right now and take a look at our live LAX camera. And there we can see this part of the coast has some cloud cover moving in. Again, it's that marine layer, which will be pretty much just to the coastal spots, not pushing much farther east than the coastal valleys. Outside we go, swing the camera now to downtown LA, and there we can see things looking pretty nice. Mostly clear skies right now, 63 degrees of temp. And we're showing calm winds and now 56% relative humidity. And today, 76 the afternoon high, way above the 68 normal high for this date. 524 was a gorgeous sunset, sunrise at 650. And today we're going to have more of the same that we had yesterday and more of the week ahead. And it's all domination by this ridge of high pressure right there. And it's not a real strong wind. So no, there's no real strong winds to it and no real really high temps. But it does give enough of an offshore push to keep the marine layer just to the coastal areas and not much inland at all. Looking ahead to Wednesday and Thursday, that high stays in place, builds up a little bit. So we'll see a little bit more warmth, a little more heat on the inland areas by the end of the week. For numbers tonight, down to 53 in Palm Springs, 28 at Big Bear, 40 in Palmdale, overnight low to 52 in Malibu. And then tomorrow's highs, again, the coast being a little bit cloudier, so staying cooler at 68 for Malibu. But look at inland. We're going to 79 in Fillmore, 77 for San Bernardino, 79 for Lake Elsinore. Michigan Viejo goes to 74, and Palm Springs tops off at 78 tomorrow. Now we look ahead. Seven-day power back, weather watch. Morning clouds and then afternoon sunshine for LA Metro and Orange County getting to 72s for the highs to start the week. And then here comes that warm up a little bit. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday up to mid 70s, taking that into the weekend for the valleys and the Inland Empire. Mostly sunny skies, 75 for the highs. And the warming begins on Wednesday. That high builds up a little bit more so. So by Thursday and Friday, we're up to 77 degrees and still taking into upper 70s into the weekend as well. Our beach areas will be cloudier and cooler. So numbers there not getting much above 70 until we get to Saturday with a 71. For the most part, though, morning clouds, afternoon sunshine, except for Thursday. Could see that fog last a little bit longer in the morning hours on the coastal spots. Mountain spots will be pretty nice, cool and breezy with the numbers in the upper 50s all through the week. But those well, the high clouds that are in on the first part, gone by the week and, and the weekend. We'll see numbers back up 58, 57, but clear skies, but very cold nights, though. Watch out there. High desert areas are going to be sunny all week, starting out with mostly sunny skies and a little breezy conditions, just a little bit, but below the advisory level for winds. And then we'll see the numbers go in the 70, 71 range all the way through the week to a little bump up on Saturday to 73, 71 by Sunday. You want to run another half marathon next Sunday? No. Are you sure? I'm going to the weather will be nice again. I'm going to need two weeks to recover from oh, this. Oh, there you go. Have to carry me. I was about to say, that's what we're doing between shows. We carry her around the newsroom, just so you know. Yes. Yes. We are doing that. No, I won't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's the old Kurt Sandoval. <laughs> To quote the late, great Jack Buck, uh -huh. I can't believe what I just saw at the Super Bowl. Marshawn Lynch had nothing to say, remember, all week at the Super Bowl. Sure, he might have something to say now. Seattle was one yard away from a repeat. But instead of putting it into the hands of Lynch, the leading rusher in the playoffs, 
Seattle threw it, and they threw away the Vince Lombardi Trophy in the process. A flyby, courtesy of the Thunderbirds, just an appetizer to an incredible game. Crazy to think the scoreboard was zeros after the first. Tom Brady then finds Big Gronk there, and the Patriots were up by seven. The Seahawks didn't take a knee right before half. They marched down the field in 29 seconds. Russell Wilson to Chris Matthews, who was working at Foot Locker just a couple of months ago. 30 minutes of Katy Perry didn't slow down the Seahawks. They kept it going, and when Doug Baldwin has this one, they'd scored 17 straight. Game over, not with Tom Brady calling the signals. In the fourth, his fourth touchdown pass of the night, Julian Edelman. Game, set, match, Patriots, right? There's two minutes to go. No. Watch this play in the shades of Lynn Stallworth, David Tyree. Look at that. Curse keeps a hold of it. You've got to see the replay. Jermaine knows it's tipped by him and everybody else, and he comes down with it. So they get down to the one-yard line. They've got a couple of plays, but instead of handing off to Marshawn Lynch, they throw it, and Malcolm Butler said he'd studied it all week. He knew what they were going to do. He jumps the route, and that play's going to haunt Pete Carroll the rest of his life. It just gave the Vince Lombardi Trophy to Tom Terrific, 28-24. Under the NBA, Lakers are far from terrific these days in the Empire State of New York. Carlos Boozer up against the Knicks, and you want to see a pretty move. That was as good as the Super Bowl today. He had 19 points and 10 rebounds. Linsanity used to make its home in Madison Square Garden. Terrific pass there. And within uh, the Lakers ended up pulling within five of this one. But they couldn't slow down the former Syracuse star, Carmelo Anthony, with a pretty one-handed oop. Anthony was the difference in this one. In fact, he had 31 points, the all-star on the breakaway. And the Knicks win for just the 10th time all year, 92-80. Back to the Super Bowl, Marshawn Lynch was asked afterwards if he was surprised he didn't get the ball. He said, no, it's a team game. Yeah. I am shocked. I am absolutely yeah. so one of the worst calls I think in yeah, so history. Yes, so is everybody up in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, no doubt. Hurting tonight. Kurt, thank you. Yes, New tonight on Eyewitness News at 11 on ABC7, a man calls 911 saying he was shot. At the same time, the shooter calls saying he shot someone. We have the bizarre story. Plus this. You can feel the baby crowning. Ah, the bush. Ooh, a woman is behind the wheel, then she goes into labor, her frightening call for help. Those stories and all the late-breaking news on Southern California's number one newscast, Eyewitness News at 11 on ABC7. Well, up here on the news at 7, a look at which movies came out on top at the weekend box office. Plus, he's the man American Sniper is based off of. Uh, tomorrow, Texas gets ready to celebrate Chris Kyle Day.
covering Riverside, Anaheim, Torrance, and all of Southern California. This is Eyewitness News. How to Train Your Dragon 2 won the top honor at last night's 42nd Annual Annie Awards held at UCLA's Royce Hall. The DreamWorks film, which had 10 nominations, took home the Best Animated Feature Award. Big Hero 6 and Song of the Sea each had 7 nominations for the awards. All four films were Best Animated Feature Contenders, along with Cheatin', The Book of Life, The Lego Movie, and The Tale of the Princess Cayuga. American Sniper takes out another box office record, bringing in nearly $32 million, the biggest Super Bowl weekend gross ever. I'm ready. Oh, my God. I'm ready to come home. American Sniper has now made $248.9 million in six weeks. That includes just three weeks of wide release. It's the most lucrative war movie without adjusting for inflation. Paddington tied with Project Almanac for second place, both earning $8.5 million. Black or White is fourth with $6.5 million. The Boy Next Door is fifth with $6.1 million. Tomorrow, the state of Texas will honor the man depicted in the movie American Sniper. The governor of Texas says February 2nd will now be known as Chris Kyle Day. Kyle is considered one of the most lethal snipers in U.S. history. He was well-respected in military circles thanks to his 160 confirmed kills in combat. Kyle was murdered on a Texas gun range in 2013. Thanks for joining us for Eyewitness News at 7 here on LA 56. LA 56 Weekend Theater is next. Eyewitness News continues at 11 o'clock on ABC 7 anytime on ABC7.com. Good night.